thinking uh, the future of transport. So, uh, so we've been doing that with, uh, with Hyperloop. Uh, and uh, we, ha we haven't been designing the technology, but we've been designing the interface, how people uh, use the station, the pods, etc. Uh, of the initial uh, uh, trajectories uh, uh, possible, the one that was chosen was uh, Dubai. It's 110 kilometers, which is like 10 minutes in Hyperloop time. Uh, so you actually go from Abu Dhabi to Dubai in 10, 15 minutes uh, through this distance. But of course, this is a technology that is expandable. So I, uh, in the future, it will connect the entire Gulf uh, all the way to Riyadh and, and to Kuwait uh, uh, through uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, and what is also interesting about the Hyperloop is to really think there is a there is a transport system that, uh, that of course, w once you look into the into the history of transport, you see an exponential growth on the speed, uh, but you also see that despite the airplane being faster, it's not the most efficient because we all know the amount of time that we waste in airports. So it's efficient beyond a certain distance, but it's extremely inefficient because of all the time, for, for medium distance because of all the time you lose at the airport. So the Hyperloop is exponentially more efficient because you don't have all the boredom and all the trouble of going to the airport. And because uh, and because it, uh, it it travels even faster than the airplane, and so the, the 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 ecosystem is made out of a pod, which uh, which has uh, six seats, and each pod can be designed differently. And of course, there are cargo pods, and all of these pods go inside what we call the transporter, and it is the transporter that goes inside the tube in vacuum. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a movie that shows the connection between the, the two and. Uh, I'm just going to pass it slightly forward to give it a test. The Hyperpod is the long haul vehicle of the Hyperloop One system. It is a comfortable and safe transport hall for passenger and cargo pods. All levitation and guidance systems fit seamlessly underneath. Secure airlocks are at each end. Inside the hyperpod, passenger and cargo pods can glide smoothly at airline speeds right to their destination. So I'm just going to pass it here now. I'm just showing that it's faster than an airplane. <laughs> but, uh, so we designed two of the stations, the, the Abu Dhabi station, which is like uh, this, uh, this ring that touches the ground to enable accessibility, uh, where inside you see uh, circulation uh, distinct uh, from, uh, of course, pedestrians and the pods. Uh, this is the, the station in, uh, in uh, Dubai, uh, in, uh, uh, next to Burj Khalifa. So this is a different station because of its different uh, needs for capacity. So it's a tiered station. We have several different levels. Um, but the principle is the same. And then uh, this is the interior of the pod with the six seaters. And uh, this is the view of the station and the entrance uh, towards, the, towards the, uh, the entrance at, at Burj Khalifa. So, of course, what is also interesting about uh, the Hyperloop technology is not only that it enables, it's scalable. And so, it's scalable uh, at the planetary level, at, the, uh, at, the, at an intercontinental level, right? Because you can connect different continents, but it's also scalable at the planetary level. And what is even more interesting is that unlike airplanes that depend on atmosphere to, to travel, Hyperloop doesn't because it, uh, it, uh, it depends on, uh, it, it runs on vacuum. So you can actually use the technology to, to once we, uh, once we come, come, uh, colonize uh, Mars. And uh, 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 but with that said, I would just like to share the, the last project, which is a, a project for uh, uh, Mars that, uh, that uh, we were invited by the Dubai Future Foundation to, to think uh, uh, what to be a, a, a future uh, Martian habitat. Uh, so to create a manual, a Mars ma uh, catalog for how to live on Mars. Uh, so both from uh, what you harvest, how do you build, uh, because you won't be able to build, uh, to bring uh, steel, you won't be able to bring glass, you would have to produce everything locally. Uh, so they asked us to, to think of a, of a, of, a, of a project that was derived from, uh, from Martian uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and this is then, uh, and of course, like there was a, a, a side uh, 
a project on this, which is almost like a sample case of the, of the project, which is this education uh, center uh, for uh, the future of space travel uh, that we were building, that we would uh, that we plan to build on, a, on an area that is uh, pretty much like a headmark. Uh, uh, but of course, like what, what is interesting also when, uh, when designing is that here, what we see in a, in a, 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 on Earth uh, being uh, working in, uh, in compression, these would be EPFE cushions, uh, right? And these would be uh, steel rods that, uh, uh, that work, or steel uh, beams that work in compression. In Mars, it's actually the opposite. So the geometry and the principles are done uh, based on uplift. So these would not be EPFEs, they would actually be pulled up. The, the rods that you see would be Keva rods to hold and tie the structure down because there's uplift that the rather than comfortable. And the, the, these orange uh, buildings are actually the, the necessary structural anchors for, for, uh, to avoid uplift. Uh, the architecture looks almost like a Middle Eastern architecture because like in the Middle East, the materials used have to be the local materials. So we would use the soil of Mars to produce buildings. And uh, the reason also why we would use the soil of Mars uh, is, uh, is partially because we would use it to, to 3D print. So the reason why the architecture also all looks rounded is because it's the most efficient way of 3D printing. Uh, so there are no corners, just complete, uh, uh, it's just a continuous deposit. And uh, the reason also why it's earth is because earth is one of the best materials to, to, to prevent uh, radiation. So basically you can't survive for a long time on the outskirts of the bubbles. Uh, because you can be like one to two hours uh, per day there. But, uh, but Earth uh, protects uh, uh, extremely well from radiation. So that's why all the buildings are also done uh, out of uh, Earth. Uh, but what protects better even than Earth, like uh, water is seven times better at protecting from radiation than, uh, than Earth. So actually what we've done is that we propose that uh, we designed uh, some skylights to, to uh, be pools of water that protect more from radiation, but they also enable daylight to, to come in. So of course, we'll be on Mars, so we'll have to produce our own food without aquaponics and hydroponics. Uh, and uh, of course, there will hopefully be also time for, for leisure. Uh, so that's uh, the scenario in, uh, in on Earth, and this is hopefully the scenario in the future on, uh, on Mars. Thank you. building with soil and I was working on that so uh, one of my ideas was also going to Mars and build there with soil so uh, I saw that you are going to use 3D printers so how is it going to be the transportation of those 3D printers because um, like, like robotics maybe like huge robots because whenever we travel to uh, an extraterrestrial planet um, it's usually we try to avoid extra weights in the spacecraft, right? Mm -hmm. So is there like a discussion about that? that no, of course, I mean, all the, the entire ecosystem of, uh, of how we do things is because the uh, plan was planned uh, with, with that. So because there's a degree of, uh, of things that, uh, that we bring along. Uh, but of course there's a lot that we, we need to produce. So in the soil of Mars there's regolite that enables you to, to build the the uh, other metals and, and steel, and of course we, we will still have the uh, uh, what the, the so-called uh, still uh, uh, blueprints or the the, the the ideas for or the principles of that on how to build these things. But the materiality needs to be all harvested from a local environment. So we know we have water, we have uh, uh, other uh, substances that enable us to do what we do here on Earth. So uh, the production will also be local, but of course bringing a minimum. Uh, 
uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Earth. So of course, like the project here is not shown the full extension. Uh, there's a there's a whole set on how uh, how these communities can evolve, and also the scaling of these communities is actually the beginning of a small community, and uh, and how uh, as they grow, production also increases, and uh, and these things uh, become self-sustainable. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Can you explain a little bit about the design process of BIG and how you use digital tools in design? Yeah, exactly. Uh, good point, considering the, the, the topic of the event. Uh, no, I mean, for, for us, uh, like uh, technology, and the reason why I don't uh, uh, over, uh, uh, overdo the discourse around technology is because technology for us is ubiquitous. It's like a, it's like water, and like uh, in our process, it's like water or internet. Uh, so, I mean, uh, once you look into the Shenzhen Energy Mansion, uh, we have people programming. I programmed it back in the days when we started programming at, at Big. So I programmed the facade. We have a milling, we have, we have milling machines, we have uh, 3D printers, we have a group. Now we're hijacking people from SpaceX, engineers, uh, to, to develop. And because our process, our design process is... is, uh, is uh, is, uh, is a lot about uh, uh, research in the very beginning and uh, a lot about uh, studying the, the local uh, conditions. And all of that can also be, uh, it's so rational that it can be, uh, can be uh, an AI system doing it. So we also have these, uh, uh, the, uh, these engineers from, uh, that, we, that we stole from SpaceX, from Elon, to, uh, to, to, that are currently investigating uh, AI in the office. And with that, uh, I mean, we have several other projects uh, uh, developing uh, with, uh, with technology, 3D printing, and, uh, and other things. So technology has, has, a, has a massive role, but it's just present. Uh, it's present in, in everything we do. Uh, and uh, and so, so the design process, on the other hand, is something that, uh, and we typically don't like to, uh, several other offices uh, have harder uh, hierarchies and, uh, and, and structures, and they also segregate the, the typologies of the projects. Uh, as you would think in research groups. But uh, typically we think that we all benefit far more with our flat uh, hierarchy and the flat structure in the office uh, where everyone has a word to say. So the inter everyone in the design team has a word to say on these weekly updates that we send internally. But also like that no one has a specific uh, capacity or, or uh, because it's that promiscuity that enables projects to steal ideas from other programs and, and apply them and create novelty in other contexts that otherwise if you're living in your own cubicle and with a, with a program separated, you wouldn't uh, intertwine. And that's the same with technology. So technology is just uh, everyone, uh, uh, we try that uh, everyone learns their own thing, uh, that they're interested, because that's how you also uh, uh, create uh, better people at what they do. Not everyone needs to know everything, they just need to know what they love doing. And if we have, if, we, if the office is loaded with people that love what they're doing, then we're, we're going to be pretty well at that office. Well, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is the last uh, question, okay? Because we have a tight schedule. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, coming from this latest like, like uh, question, I was wondering, uh, what would be your suggestions regarding the future of our uh, architectural education? So. Uh, what you've learned out of your experience in BIG, how would you propose to change uh, education in architecture in general? Uh, it, it's funny, like we were just having this discussion a, 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 a bit before, uh, uh, because some, uh, some of my uh, friends are uh, both in Coimbra and uh, in Porto and uh, in, in other schools, and um, it, it's really like Somehow the discourse around architectural education or what we're teaching to, uh, to, 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 to young and future architects has been, uh, has been uh, slightly uh, constrained from exposure. And I mean, I think exposure and the dialogue from the things that actually really matter on the decision making of the design process, which is a discussion. Uh, I, 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 I have the feeling that, I mean, at the office, we really, that, that research period. Uh, that we do initially is really the, the period where we investigate the social, the economical, the political, the cultural, and the ecological circumstances that surround a project. 
and uh, and we we somehow we try to always focus on uh, on trying to understand with everyone's uh, efforts what is the what is everyone created added value what is how is everyone creating added added, added value and try to learn from it try to learn from different directors try to learn from different uh, uh, artists from different projects and actually bring everything together to a to a fruitful discussion so i think segregating topics Segregating technology is not as practical. Segregating exposure to discuss uh, economics is not a topic. Is not. A, it shouldn't be. Uh, it should not be also a, a strategy. I think like bringing everything together uh, is uh, is extremely meaningful and fruitful. I mean, because the reason why we are successful, or uh, we think we are, uh, is uh, 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 is because we. Like the discussion around the standard is, uh, and, and everyone follows the standard because the standard is really good. It's really good at doing one thing. And I think the standard is often what is taught at schools. Uh, but but also the standard only responds to one solution. What we do at the office is say, we're not going to do one thing. We're going to do several things. We're going to pile on demand, the social, the economical, the political, the cultural demands. And we're going to mix all that and see how each circumstances, in which circumstances the projects can create uh, uh, value and of course we make our lives more difficult, but we also make the solution more exciting. And I think that's the debate uh, that we shouldn't be constrained of, uh, of not talking about things. We should just talk about everything as much as possible and expose uh, expose the students to everything they want to be exposed. Uh, and often we're also discussing that sometimes uh, with someone else that sometimes uh, the programs are. Uh, uh, can be too vast because we also want to give everyone freedom, and they should be vast. But also, like Einstein said, you know, uh, choice is the is the is the is the envy of creativity. When he was asked, "Why do you have ten suits in your closet that are all look alike?" That's what he responded. That it was the opposite of, of creativity. So I think sometimes, sometimes also, like we know that innovation emerges out of a out of a constraint. It emerges out of a when uh, countries are in uh, economic constraint, you have fantastic things emerging and so on. So I think like a bit, uh, sometimes a bit of steering enables better ideas to come. It's it may be easier for for educators also, but also like uh, to really explore the true potential of, of what uh, of what students uh, can do. So an open debate and uh, and uh, and uh, a bit more of uh, uh, not be so vague because otherwise we have situations where again speculation about the future. It becomes utopias, and utopias are really irrelevant because we cannot design for tomorrow if we're not using the ingredients of, the, of today. Okay. Thank you.